All right. Good afternoon, everybody, dear colleagues, dear students, dear guests. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you today to this special Zurich Physics Colloquium. And it's my honor to introduce to you today's speaker, our own Mauro Denega of the Institute of Particle Physics of ETH. Mauro grew up in Italy. He's born in Lecco, but spent most of his academic life in Switzerland. He graduated summa cum laude from the University of Geneva on a PhD thesis on the ATLAS experiment and the CDF experiment at the Tevatron in the United States under the supervision of Professor Alan Clark. During this time, during his PhD times, we actually had the pleasure to work together on a common project. So I have fond memories of a research trip to the Rutherford Appleton lab near Oxford in the UK where we uh, survived an interesting trip driving on the wrong side of the road <laughs> and, uh, and spending, spending an interesting night in the cafeteria of the lab because we went home to bed uh, too, too late to our uh, inn, which was closed at 11 p.m. <laughs> so after these adventures uh, that uh, Mauro survived with distinction, he took a prestigious research fellowship at CERN and he continued his involvement at the ATLAS experiment, working on pixel detector technology and also the reconstruction of photons, an ingredient of uh, the hunt for the Higgs boson, as we will see later in his talk. After a second postdoctoral appointment at the University of Pennsylvania, we were lucky to steal him from our competitors on ATLAS, convinced him to join our ETS, uh, ETH CMS group, uh, a group which is under the supervision of Günther de Sartori, Felicitas Paus, Christoph Grab, and myself, and he's now an Oberassistent with ETH. Since then, Mauro has quickly rose up to be a young leader in the CMS team, uh, joining forces with uh, postdocs and students from ETH and other groups in CMS to pursue the hunt for the Higgs boson in particular the decay to the two-photon final state, uh, a search which is very much related to the topic of today. As you've undoubtedly heard, there was a milestone reached in this search during the summer, and um, he will then uh, enlighten us on the state of affairs in the search for the Higgs boson. So with not too much further ado then, I'll hand over to Mauro and see what insights he will give us in the question, is it the Higgs boson? Thank you, Rainer, for the, such a kind introduction. And thank you all for being here today. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to show you the latest results on the Higgs boson. As Rainer was mentioned a second ago, this is what happened the 4th of July at CERN. Here you see a crowded main auditorium with a few distinguished guests. Top left you see um, Francois Engler from Brussels and Peter Higgs, two of the finding figures of the Higgs theory. Here you see the two spokesmen, spokespersons, Fabiola and Joe, from uh, Atlas and CMS a number of former director generals, and a lot of young people, particularly here you see Nicola, uh, sorry, <laughs> Niklas <laughs> and Michael from ETH sitting in the room as analysis experts in case nasty question would arise during the talk. Then the news bounced around the entire world. It made it to the first page of all newspapers and eventually also to the scientific literature. So, the question is why we're studying high energy physics. Well, some of us will do it because we want to understand the basic building blocks of the universe and get to what is really elementary and understand its interactions. Some others might have different opinions about why we want to do this. Nevertheless, The actual understanding of our universe today is based on this new version of the periodic table where we have 12 particles and four forces. The four forces are mediated by this boson, the photon, which is the mediator of the electromagnetic interactions, the gluon, which is the mediator of the strong force, what 
among other things, allows to keep the quarks together in the nuclei and the W and Z bosons that are responsible for uh, the weak interactions, which, for instance, is uh, the cause of uh, natural radioactivity. The other 12 particles here are divided in quarks and leptons. We separate them in this way because of their interactions. And in the quarks, we have the up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. And in the leptons, we have the charged ones, electron, muons, and taus, and the respective partners, neutrinos. The interesting thing in this table here is that there is a certain periodicity. So we have three generations of particles. All of them have the same exact feature, but they differ in mass. Now, how we understand the interactions between all these particles is written here on this, beautifully summarized in this Lagrangian on, on this mug. This is the Lagrangian of the standard model. And among other things that we learn about this is we now unify the electromagnetic interactions and the weak force is what we call now the electroweak force. But this Lagrangian here has some interesting features. Forced by the underlying gauge symmetry, all particles should be massless. But as we know in real life, these particles have a mass, and they actually have a wide range of masses. We go from neutrino masses, which are very small, but not zero, and this we know because of neutrino oscillation experiment, up to the heaviest one, which is 180 GeV, which is the mass of the top quark. So, the symmetry that you see in the Lagrangian is somehow not visible if you just look at the masses in, uh, in, in the real life. Now, this is not totally new to physics. The symmetry is there, but you don't see it. The point is the Lagrangian has a symmetry, but the solution of the Lagrangian do not. For instance, this is what happens in our solar system. The solar system, the Lagrangian, has a central uh, symmetric potential, but when you look at the solution of this, at the orbits of the planet, they're not circular. They have an elliptic shape. And it took the genius of Newton to, to get out the symmetry out of this kind of observation. Now, I would like to try to explain you the Higgs mechanism in a similar way. I struggled really hard to find a simple way to explain you the Higgs mechanism without hiding behind too many formulas. And I ended up with a half hand-waving, half formulas kind of explanation. So I guess, as Feynman was saying, if you can't explain something in simple terms, it really means you don't understand it so well. So that's probably the reason why. So here we are. The, we have to think the universe filled with a scalar field, the Higgs field. And this field has this weird shape potential. Now, the field is a complex field in this example. So you have two components. And the minimum of energy of this potential is not in 0, 0, 0, but it's somewhere shifted over. Now, randomly, one direction in this potential is chosen, and this is now the minimum of my potential. The symmetry is somehow broken. Now, if you do perturbation theory around this minimum, you get out with massive part of the excitation, radial excitation of this will give you massive particles, and then you also have what they call Goldstone bosons running around here, other mass less particles. So now you wanted to add mass to particles, and what you end up with is yet more massless particles. That looks like a disaster, but then the miracle occurs, and if you enforce the local gauge invariance, so adding covalence derivatives and so on, then what happens is that your vector boson will acquire a mass term, and something else appears here, which is a massive state. So now, at the end of this slide, usually, up to a few months ago, we used to say, and this state is not yet observed experimentally, and so on. And now, we might have a, a good candidate for this one. The rest of the talk would be explaining whether the good candidate we have is really this one, or maybe something else. So if you were not able to follow this uh, explanation, as I wouldn't in your seat, then I have a, a very imperfect analogy, but maybe helps. So suppose you are a particle and you don't have any Higgs field around. So you're free to move wherever you want. There's no interaction with anything. You, this is how you would feel if you were a massless particle. Now, when you add the Higgs field, you're not free to move anywhere, everywhere you want freely. You are interacting with this, uh, with this field. And by doing this, you somehow 
in this case you get a friction, uh, you acquire somehow a mass, and this comes from the interactions with the field. Now you might have a small mass, so your interaction with the field is very small, or maybe you might have a much larger mass. <coughs> That means it interacts a lot with the field. Now, of course, this analogy, of course, is basically a cartoon, and its main limitation is that whenever these cars stop, they won't feel the friction anymore, while the mass will still be there anyway. So now, how do we create a Higgs boson? Well, I will use this rather uh, well-known uh, relation the way we create the X-boson is to pump enough energy in the vacuum in order to extract massive state. If you want to create a very massive state, you have to pump in a lot of energy. So the way we do this is with this machine, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. This is an aerial picture of the LHC. In real life, you wouldn't see anything because it's about 100 meters underground. And here you can see Lake Geneva, the jet d'eau, barely visible, and the more blank in, in the back. So the machine is there and is operating now, but there is already a very long history. So in 1984, during the Los Angeles Olympic Games, there was the, war, the first workshop, the Lausanne workshop, where the LHC was officially born. And then a few years later, in 87, there was the first comparison of different ideas of accelerator in the Latwil workshop, where you had the LSC put on the same table with CLIC, which is a linear E plus E minus collider, and another option for the LSC where you had an electron and a proton beam. And that was the year of Star Trek, next generation. End of the 80s, revolutionary here for Europe, um, is basically the beginning of the large collaboration that we will see later on during the talk. For the first time, people start gathering around designs of detector. In 1990, this was the first workshop where we really looked at the LHC physics and instrumentation, and I know at least a person in this room was giving a talk about that. And it's the year where the Hubble Space Telescope was launched. And finally, in 95, the LSC conceptual design was frozen with the actual center of mass energy of 14 TeV with the luminosity, nominal luminosity of 10 to the 34, and it's the year where the shuttle docked to the Mir space station. So when we talk about the LHC, we're really not talking about one accelerator. Uh, this is a complete picture of all the accelerators complex at CERN, and the journey of a proton will start from here, from Linux 4, gets into the booster, accelerated all the way to the PS, then transferred to the SPS, and the SPS will bring the energy of the protons up to 450 GeV. In order to get to this energy, it takes about 15 seconds. Then the protons are, transfers, are transferred to the LHC in one direction and the other. They go one clockwise and the other counterclockwise, the beams. And it takes another 20 minutes to run them up to flat top energy of 4 TeV. Then we let the beam in the machine, we squeeze them, we collide them in four points, and we let them in collision mode for about 10 hours or so. So where do we collide the particles? It's in four points around the ring, and these four points are instrumented with four detectors. There are two general purpose detectors, CMS and ATLAS. Uh, general purpose means we have collision, and we want to understand what's coming out, no matter what. Any exotic kind of scenario, we want to understand what it is. And then we have two dedicated detectors. One is LHCB, dedicated to the study of the B quarks properties, and the other one is ALICE, which studies the heavy ions collision. The LHC can accelerate protons, but also lead ions. It's really a multi-purpose accelerator somehow. When we talk about... Uh, collaborations, CMS and Atlas, for instance, we're talking about really a worldwide enterprise. Here we're talking about about 3,000 physicists each from institutes all over the world. Here are the two maps where you see where people are coming from, and it's really basically from everywhere. So before getting to what we found with this detector, I would like to spend a second or two just to describe how, uh, how they work. So here is a slice 
of CMS during installation, and you have to imagine the proton beam coming from one side and the other and collide in the center of the detector. From there, the particles will, the, the debris from the collision will spread out in, in this detector. How do we see the particles coming out? So we take this slice of the detector and we focus a bit on this to see how this is done in real life. So when we call CMS a detector, it's really a, a misnaming. CMS is a large number of detectors all put together in order to collect all the information about the, the collision. It has this onion shape, and starting from the beginning, so the collisions will happen here, you will have a silicon tracker followed by an electromagnetic calorimeter, a nadronic calorimeter, a big solenoid that in the case of CMS uh, contains all these components, and then in the return yoke of the magnetic field, uh, which is made by, with steel, this steel is instrumented with muon chambers to study the muons. Now the point is, how we, do we distinguish the different particles coming out? So, starting from a photon, a photon is a neutral particle, so it will not in feel the magnetic field, which is four Tesla inside here, it will just go straight, and end its life in the electromagnetic calorimeter, creating a shower. What it means is that it goes into the calorimeter, it starts interacting, it creates pairs of electrons and, and positrons that emits other photons and so on and so forth, and creates what it looks like a shower, so a deposit of energy there. An electron looks very much like a photon, but it's a charged particle, so it will be uh, curved in the magnetic field, and you will see reconstruct the track. The main difference between an electron and a photon is the track pointing to it. A charged hadron, again, is charged, and it will be uh, curved in the magnetic field. It will pass through the electromagnetic calorimeter and end up creating a shower into the hadronic calorimeter, and pretty much the same thing for a neutral hadron, but the neutral hadron is not charged, and so it will just go straight without leaving any track in the, in the tracker. Finally, the muons, the muons are very penetrating particles. They will go through the entire detector. Actually, a few of those will arrive at the surface 100 meters above on, on the top. And they have this wiggle shape because of the magnetic field in the different uh, direction that they feel. So CMS is a pretty gigantic machine. It's uh, 12,500 tons in weight and has a diameter of 15 meters with a length of 22 meters. If I put Atlas next by, Atlas is much lighter, it's only 7,000 tons, and it's 26, diameters in, 26 meters in diameter. Careful, most of this volume here is actually get taken by this huge toroids outside, so it's basically air. That's why when I was in Atlas, we used to have this famous joke, if we flood the cavern, CMS will sink and Atlas will float. Now, I cannot use this joke anymore because I jumped ship. Um, and the overall length is 46 meters, so it's really enormous. Now, the interesting thing is that two collaborations decided to develop different technology to solve the same problems. For instance, the tracker in CMS is made entirely by silicon modules pixel and the strip detectors. In Atlas, they decided to have an inner part built with silicon modules, and I, on the outside part of, uh, of the tracker, we have a gas detector. This gas detector is able to collect transition radiation, which is a way to distinguish electrons from all other particles. So we have a basic particle identification in the tracker. The calorimeters, again, very different choices, uh, CMS went for an homogeneous calorimeter made by several thousand crystals, which has an astonishing resolution in energy, and so in mass, as we will see, and it is a key component for the Higgs search in decaying into electrons and photons, in Z and electrons and photons. And Atlas went for a different kind of calorimeter. It's a sampling calorimeter with liquid argon, and it has this wiggle shape, this accordion shape, so that we don't have cracks in phi, and is divided into three compartments. Finally, what's really 
very different in these two detectors is the magnetic field. Uh, CMS has a four Tesla solenoid. Atlas has a solenoid, but only two Tesla. CMS contains the tracker and all the calorimetry in this magnetic field. Atlas only the tracker. But outside, here we have the return yoke instrumented with muons chambers, while in Atlas we have this gigantic toroid that creates a toroidal magnetic field instrumented with, uh, with uh, muon chambers to study muons. Now, a small parenthesis on the role of Switzerland in all this. So, Switzerland was a key player in, in CMS from the very beginning. For instance, for the superconducting coil, we had the engineering and the procurement of this huge solenoid. You have to think that the internal volume is 360 cubic meters. It's really great. Uh, on the ECAL, we had clear leading role, and I'll come back to this in a second. And on the tracker, we help with the micro strips detectors and together with the PSI University of Zurich, uh, basically the entire barrel pixel detector was built from scratch. A, an enormous enterprise per se. So for the calorimeter, as I said, um, CMS decided to go for a very high resolution crystal calorimeter. And this is absolutely essential for the case of the Higgs to gamma gamma and the Higgs ZZ in, in, in electrons. Uh, here, the crucial study that was done at ETH was about the radiation hardness. Um, these crystals are mounted in a very harsh environment where radioactivity is very high. And so, by design, we understand that these crystals get damaged. The wall R&D was to find the right material to be able to sustain such a high uh, radiation damage and to build it into a design that even if you lose a bit of transparency, you can recover it somehow. So this is what happens. This is a crystal that we tested by shooting at it the entire radiation that it will collect in the entire life of the LHC. It develops some color absorption centers in the blue. That's why it looks so yellowish here. And here you also see that hadron damage with, will create some defects that scatters light around. So the crystals are damaged at the end of the life of, of CMS. And during this span uh, of time, we are able to operate it and correct. And as you will see in, in a second, this is the key component to get the resolution out. Uh, here, the number of crystals, 76,000 crystals, have been produced by two different companies, one in Russia, one in China. And these crystals have to be almost identical in performance in order to be able, in order not to die calibrating the detector, basically. And this is the result of this production is really astonishing. And then finally, there was the integration of all the different parts of the electronics and, and to put it into the final detector. And now we're taking care about operation and control of it. So back to physics and about the proton-proton collision. I will use this diagram quite a number of times in the talk. So this is what I used to explain that protons, when you collide protons, you're really colliding not elementary particles, but something that is composed by quarks and gluons. So what you're really colliding are quarks and gluons. So what happens here is that this is the two incoming protons. Here is a quark or a gluon in the center of mass energy of root square of s, and then eventually we'll create some two uh, decay products that we call generically C and D. So if you want to get to the cross section of a proton proton given C and D, whatever that could be, any final state you wish, you can start from the initial uh, cross section from quarks and gluons, but then you have to integrate over the entire phase space of the momentum taken by these two particles. Take an example a bit more concrete. Uh, if you want to create an X boson, one of the mechanisms is through the gluon-gluon fusion. You create this boson and then decays into photons. And here you have the two proton remnants that just fly basically down the, down the beam pipe. This is what you will see in your detector where you have tracks and, the re and, and other energy. And here you have the two electrons sticking out these two bars are the visual representation of the energy deposited into the electromagnetic calorimeter. Now, 
Another key component of this is that most of what uh, you look like, well, most of what you look in your detector is background. Almost everything you collect, you, you create in this collision is background. If you're interested in some signal, like the Higgs, you have to go down about 10 orders of magnitude in probability to create this particle. So it's clear we need a super efficient guy like this, selecting out the interesting collisions, and to reduce the data volume from about a billion collisions per second down to the 500, we can really store on tape and then we analyze. So this is a diagram of the luminosity showing what we collected over the years. The first here is in green here, but this curve here is multiplied times 100 to be able to see it on this plot. And with this small luminosity here, which is 0.04 femtobarn, we were able to basically go through the entire history of particle physics, rediscovering all the known particles. Then in 2010, again, at 7 TeV, we collected, we, the LSC delivered six invest femtobarn, and this here at 8 TeV, we're already this plot is the latest one I had. It was a few days ago. We we're already passing the 20 TV. What is the luminosity? Well, the luminosity times this cross section is what gives you the number of events you collect at the end. So, with an inverse, uh, with a luminosity of about 20 inverse femtobarn times a cross section typical of the Higgs of 10 picobarns, the number of X events we produce are about 200,000. It doesn't mean that we saw all of them in our detector. We're able to select this. I will come to this in the next slide. Now, there's a price you have to pay to get a large, a very high luminosity. That is, a lot of events will just pile up on top of each other. So this is a particularly busy event where you have 78 reconstructed vertices. And from here, you will have to fish out the one you're interested in, your Higgs candidate. Now we go to the Higgs production. So here I'm using this diagram, and I focus only on the initial part of it. We have different ways to produce the Higgs. The largest cross -sec production cross-section is given by the gluon fusion, followed by a vector boson fusion, where the two quarks emit a vector boson, a W or a Z, they fuse and they create a Higgs boson. And this is about an order of magnitude lower. Then even lower cross-sections with the associated production, where you have a Higgs radiated off a W or a Z, a vector boson. And then finally, TT bar H production, where the Higgs is radiated off one of the two tops produced here. You can see here this uh, curves here appear with a, a band. And this band are so small, thanks to the, our theory colleagues, that works really high to extract a very precise prediction of this mechanism. Once you produce the Higgs, it will immediately decay. And these are the different possible decay modes. So here you see a span in, in energy. Usually this plot goes up to 1 TeV. I just cut it because there's really not much going on in this side. There's the TT bar production, sorry, decay, but uh, it's not relevant for this talk. And you see that depending on the hypothetical mass of the Higgs, we didn't know where the this boson could arise. So we have to calculate it for all possible hypotheses. Depending on the mass, you will have channels like WW or the ZZ. And the lower you go in mass, the more kinematically accessible channels you have. For instance, here, you shouldn't be fooled by the different branching ratios. For instance, the gamma gamma and the BB bar are something like three orders of magnitude apart. But the gamma gamma is a very nice signature to high energy photons, very nice resolution. The BB bar is a lower resolution. And so this one at the end is even more sensitive than this guy. So you have to be very careful with this kind of plot. These are the channels we are analyzing at the LHC. And in this summary table, you see what's going on in, in, in one single slide. So here you have the gamma gamma ZZ product, uh, decay um, channels that has the, the, the best possible mass resolution of about 1 2%. Then you have the BB bar with about 10% and the tau plus time minus at about 15%. And the WW, it's, we call it 20%, it effectively has no mass resolution because of the neutrinos in the final state. And so you will see it as a, an excess of events, uh, just counting basically or with some shape analysis. Here the, L, the analysis taken by uh, ETH and University of Zurich, as you see, we're basically covering quite a large phase space of analysis. 
And in this corner of the table, you see in the bullets uh, the analysis that take advantage of the entire luminosity collected by the experiment, and few of them are not taking full advantage of this. Why? Well, because the experiment are still working on this, and the results are not yet to, to go out public. We're still finalizing it. That's because these analyses are complex, and I will go through one specific channel, the gamma gamma, simply because I'm biased, I'm working on that. Okay, so you will say, so what's so difficult about this? You have the two photons, you get the opening angle, you have a simple formula, you get out the candidate mass. So why it takes so long? Well, the point is that the analysis itself is a kind of a gigantic industry. So this is the case of CMS. We have about 60 physicists working on this. On Atlas, it's about the same. And this is a simplified uh, diagram that shows you the analysis. Somewhere here, you have the detector that gives you the data. And then the more you run to the right, you have the final results. It's not a analysis, one analysis, one PhD student. It's mostly one PhD student, one of these boxes in the analysis. One of the crucial points about uh, this analysis is the mass resolution, which really means the energy resolution of the two photons. And for this one, we take the Z decaying to E plus, E minus. This is by now the standard candle to do this kind of uh, calibration. Back in the 80s, for the UA1, this was worth a Nobel Prize, but now this is really our reference for all this kind of calibration. You will see here, this is the best possible scenario for CMS, and we are even below the 1% uh, resolution. It's important to get this uh, performance stable with time, and you see over a span, this is the, uh, the data taking period, you see that the, this curve here, which is our resolution after uh, old calibration is about one per mil. What you see here is what I was telling you before, uh, what happens on the crystals. And this was constructed like this by design. So the scale here is about 3%. We take data, we are at the detector, the crystal lose transparency. When we switch off, they actually recover. So they go up, so they lose transparency when they radiate it. You don't irradiate them, they recover, and then they go down again, and so on and so forth. And we have a very sophisticated way to calibrate this away and make it down to this one per mil resolution. Now, this is what you get at the end. At this point, once you've done all your calibration, you put everything together, you can calculate the M invariant mass here, and you can fill this kind of plot. And this is what you see. Finally, here you see this nice peak emerging. What's visible from this plot is the huge background underneath. This is really uh, very big. So one of the obvious questions you might ask is, yeah, sure, this is your signal. What about if this is just a background fluctuation? I mean, with all those backgrounds, can happen. And so we develop, we, we use some statistical tool to analyze this. For instance, the p-value, we have several others I'm not showing, and the p-value is basically the probability that the background will fluctuate up creating a fake bump, and you think you're looking at the signal, but that is not. So in this case, a very small probability to be a background fluctuation means like you're looking at some signal. This is the result by Atlas, sorry, this is Atlas, and this is CMS on the X gamma gamma alone, and you see that now we are down at probabilities of about 10 to the minus, few 10 to the minus six, and here is few 10 to the minus five. In the dashed line, you see the expected p-value you would get in the case of the standard model. So here in both cases, we got lucky somewhere. And this dashed line is what you can really use to compare the different experiments. And in this case, CMS is a bit more sensitive than, than Atlas at this point. Don't be fooled by the scales. These are different. Then we move on to a different channel, the x to zz. The z, what we're using for a calibration now, becomes something you have to reconstruct to get back to the initial Higgs. And one Z in this case decays into an electron positron pairs, the other one in a mu plus, mu minus pair. And this is what you see. Now, the important point of this decay channel is that it has a very, very small background. So the signal to background is about two to one. And this is what we were seeing over time. In the first run, we couldn't really say anything about this decay. Then in the 70V run, back in 2011, 
we analyze five inverse femtobarn, and this is what you were seeing. So these curves here that we put in were just to see what hypothetically, hypothetically an X boson would look like, but there was really basically no signal evident. Going to more statistics, now we add, and to the previous results, five inverse femtobarn and ATV, you start something, seeing something building up, and this is the present result shown last week at HCP uh, with, with the full integrated uh, luminosity. And you see that here, now the peak becomes even more visible. Now, now that we see something that, that is a boson, we want to understand all these properties. So for instance, the mass, the spin and parity, how does it couple with vectors, boson, with fermions, is the coupling proportional to the mass? Uh, how many bosons do we have? Is just one single boson? Is the standard model boson or is a boson or a Higgs boson from some other theory? Is an elementary particle itself is composite? And finally, studying the details of its potential in the self interaction. We can't answer all these questions now. We start just now sketching the face of this object. To get to the final masterpiece, we still have to collect a lot of data and put all the pieces together. This is what we have today once we put together all the channels. And here you see that the significance of this peak now goes down to 6.9 sigma, about 7. Uh, the probability that this is just a background fluctuation is ridiculously small. Now it's 310 to the minus 12, so we're pretty sure this one is not just a background fluctuation. But the p-value alone doesn't tell anything about the nature of this object. It might be the standard model Higgs or something else. So we have to study the cross-section. And in this plot, we plot the, norm, the production cross-section divided by the standard model one. So in this case, one will indicate that this is the standard model. And here you see that you're compatible with one over a quite a large range of masses, about 5 GV. If you take the best measured mass that we have today, which is 125.8, this is 0.88 plus or minus 21. So it is compatible. You can also ask yourself, what is the compatibility among the different analyses? And here is the best fit value with split up with the five analyses we have. And you see that they're all both in Atlas and CMS, they're all pretty much agreeing within one or two sigma. And here is the best measurement of the mass. So we do a likelihood scan and we get in green the gamma gamma, in red the ZZ. You see the two values are compatible already within one sigma and they combine together give us this magic 125.8. If you sum in quarter these numbers, you get about 0.5 or something. And this means that already today, we are at the level of a half a percent uh, precision on this number, on this mass. The statistics comes mostly from the machine delivering data and the detectors able to swallow them. And the systematics is really our understanding of the detector. We also try the first measurement of the spin. Uh, it decays to this boson, decays to two photons. We know it has an integer spin and is different from one because of the Landau Young theorem. But now it can be any, any integer number. We are trying to analyze with the Z, Z decay, which has two particles decaying. Uh, each of the two Z will decay in two particles defining two planes. If you study the angular correlations between these two planes, you can get to the spin of the initial object. And behind this, we have we used the dozen candidate we collected up to now. We built a likelihood for two different spin hypotheses, uh, the zero plus, the scalar standard model one, and the pseudo scalar zero minus. And we built a lot of toy experiments, all of them with the same 12 dozen statistics, uh, ZZ, and we see what is the separation between these two hypotheses. The separation between the two is only a mere two sigma, 1.93. And then when you put in the actual observation, you see that you're compatible at point a half a sigma to the standard model, and if you want, you can say it's incompatible at 2.5 sigma with the zero minus. The important thing is, keep in mind, behind this plot, there are only a dozen candidates. So this actual point here can move around with the new data collected. Then we go to the final part of the game where we want to study the unitarity. This is one of the reasons why we wanted to have the X boson. It's if you calculate, starting again from this diagram, 
this kind of process and you calculate it at very high energy, you will get some nonsense answer. Like the, production, the probability to produce this stuff goes above one. Now, in order to cure this problem, the standard model introduces the Higgs boson, and this is what you see. The cross-section doesn't diverge anymore, but it's somehow cured and it goes down. A bit more in technical terms, here is what happens. So on top of the, here I'm showing you the WW final state and the two fermions final state, on top of these diagrams you, had, you have to add the diagrams with the Higgs boson exchange. And what you do is you describe these diagrams in terms of some couplings, which is, we always refer to the standard model for simplicity, and then we multiply time as a constant. So at the end, what we, pl we will plot is always this kappa that is equal to one, it gives me back the standard model. Now if you calculate this amplitude and you put in the kappa in the right places, you see that this stuff will diverge with the center of mass energy S. It will not diverge only if, like in the standard model, you have this kV, the coupling to the vector bosons, and kF, the coupling to the fermions, equal to one. This is what we measure. So this is 1-1, one, one, the standard model, and you see that we're basically compatible with the standard model at about one sigma level. Another thing you can do is use this Higgs, or if you want, this boson, to see whether there is some physics beyond the standard model. Now, instead of looking for the standard model, use this object as a probe to go beyond. And this is what you can do. You can take this diagram here, this is the production of a Higgs that then decays in two photons. In the standard model, you have in this loop running quarks, mostly the top and the bottom, and in this loop here, you can have the W and the top. But in theory, it's beyond the standard model. Here, you can have any other virtual particle showing up, modifying the cross-sections, and so here is a, an indirect way to access this, this uh, new physics, maybe behind the door. This is what you get once you measure it. This is the coupling to the photon, the coupling to the gluon, the standard model 1-1, one, one, and here you have, again, one point something sigma away. And again, there is no striking evidence for anything beyond the standard model. We want to accumulate more data. So this is an official CMS plot. This is not an official CMS, this is just illustrative. What will happen is we shrink these ellipses, and they might end up ending up on the standard model. Here, the important point is more statistics make the ellipse much smaller, or it might end up somewhere else. This is what we're going to investigate in, in the future. Now, the question is, we don't have any strong indication uh, against the standard model. What is, if it is the standard model boson? Well, then we have to still to, to work a lot to find an answer to these questions. What is the dark matter that our astrophysicist colleagues observe? Why the world we live in is only made of matter and not where's the antimatter? What is the dark energy responsible for the expansion of the universe where we have three generations and not any other number? Uh, do the old forces unify? The standard model unifies the electromagnetic force and the weak force into the electroweak. Maybe also the strong force can couple, or maybe even the gravity. And again, on the gravity, why is so weak? The hierarchy problem, or the fine-tuning, where the mass of the Higgs is so small, what is protecting it? So, if it's not the standard model Higgs, what else could that be? Well, there are many, many theories and models beyond the standard model that can explain that. It could be a supersymmetric Higgs, a composite Higgs, it can be some hints of physics of extra dimensions, and only with more data we will be able to see this. We're planning to take more data. Uh, this is where we are now, at the end of 2012. We're gonna shut down for a couple of years at the beginning of 2013. This period here is necessary to collect uh, uh, sorry, to upgrade the, detect the accelerator up to the design energy of 14 TeV. Then we start collecting again luminosity up to this shutdown in 2018, and then here the future becomes really fuzzy, probably up to 2021-22. At this point, we should have about 300 in Fernobar. There are also other more exotic things on the market, like linear colliders, muon colliders, gamma-gamma colliders, and so on. And for this, we will have to wait a bit more to clarify what people do. So the summary, we just opened the door of the TV energy scale, and we found a new boson, and that's great. The LHC is now 
the highest energy machine is a very high luminosity machine and extremely reliable. Basically, runs without any problems at all. The experiments are themselves very reliable. They're able to swallow all this data and to produce very high quality data to be analyzed. And we're preparing, as we've seen before, uh, for the 14 TV era. Now, back to the initial question, the title of the talk. Is it really the Higgs boson? I guess at this point we don't have a firm conclusion, and we can definitely see that, say that there is no strong indication that it's not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mauro, for this nice uh, overview and perfectly on time, which leaves us time for questions. So. Ah, the easy one. <laughs> a, a precise guy. This one. That is correct. Like, so the point is, maybe this you, thing here. Maro, maybe we should repeat. We should read ah, the question. Yeah. So. so the question is, are these two peaks sitting in the same position or not? Uh, that's the question. If this is the same particle, it should sit in the same place. Uh, and many people say, ah, if it looks like this, then it's a problem of your calibrations. Well, that's not. Uh, first of all, because I'm working on this. <laughs> uh, uh, the other thing is that the real point is that you're sitting on an enormous background below. So any fluctuation of the background can move your peak around. It's not the signal that is moving, it's the background underneath. You have to imagine this like a small ship over gigantic waves. This stuff will just go up and down. It will remain in the same place as a width, and when you do the best fit of this thing, they will look like they're moving apart. If this was, well, I don't know, very far away, like, I don't know, 50 GB away, then it would be a problem. But these ones are definitely compatible amongst each other. Same slide. Um, I was sure this one was uh, You have a blurb on the left, and in, uh, I'm talking about, what is it, CMS. This one is CMS, yes. Uh, yes, you have a blurb on the left, and then another, you know, a few points above the, the red line, which do not seem to be compensated by points below the red line. Why is, is there another blurb? The question is how many exits are we f looking at? So this is really the way to, to look at these things. And at this point, the only thing we can say is that with the present amount of data, this is the only significant bit we have. This peaks here, this one, and Atlas sees some structure too. This one literally comes and goes. So if you look at the evolution with time of these peaks, they, they move around, they grow, they distinguish and so on. This one instead, it's, it can go up and down because again of the large backgrounds, but it will, it is always been in the same position basically since the very beginning. And I mean, I don't know the details of Atlas, but I guess they're, they're going to see the same thing. So the, the point is, no, we don't see any second Higgs at the moment. I'm sure many theories would love to see that. <laughs> But uh, going back uh, up and down, uh, is that because the machine is not stable in that, in that uh, sense or something else fluctuates? No, absolutely. The, the, machine is, the machine is really performing amazingly and there's nothing to do with this up and down. So l let me give you more details about this background. What is this background? So in this area here, you have different processes. Most of the collisions at the LHC will give you final jets, jets in the final state. Some of these jets can fake a photon. They will look like a photon to you, but it's really a jet. So what happens is that in this plot, you have a composition of events with two jets faking photons, one jet faking a photon, and one real photon. And the largest part of this is really quantum chromodynamics production of dye photons. So these are really nice photons, and they follow this, uh, this background distribution. The only thing that fluctuates is not the machine, 
is the statistics, if you want, the Poisson behind these processes. So each of these processes will give you a contribution to this plot, and these points can move up and down. That's what's really fluctuating. Everything else is super stable. This one is just statistics, basically. Simon? I can repeat the question if you want. May I ask a naive question as someone who counts Those identical the photons? Ones, like you've got a, what, a 5% or less excess over the background. So, in it, a sense, two questions. Are the... What are you referring to, to the In the previous plot. This one. The okay. little excess there. Okay, yes. Is, a, you know, looks, is, is about 5% or so, right. isn't it? Okay. So my question is sort of, if you're so dominated by the background, how can you get, you know, how do you, how, can you distinguish between the real events and the background? If you can't, how can you then really get the signatures of what you're looking for? Or if there are differences, can you sort of subtract the background? In astronomy, all <coughs> of our detections are identical by nature, and so we never have to deal with that. But presumably you're in a slightly different regime. Right, that's a very interesting question. So the point here is that on event by event basis, you cannot. All the events in this plot will look pretty much like this guy. You will have these two deposits of energy that will look like photons, and you're, well, you claim these are photons and they will end up in your plot. So on event by event basis, you cannot. There are then different things. One is, you know the composition below this thing, but you don't want to sit on this. You don't want to sit on some Monte Carlo prediction of what is this background, because in this case, we can really extract it from data. We know it has no structure, it follows smoothly, and so if any bump we see, we can, if you want, subtract it out, like as done by Atlas, and what gives you even more confidence that this is, apart from the statistics, uh, analysis of the data, is that in the same position, other channels that has nothing to do with the two photons will end up in the same place. So it's really when you look at a plot like this, that, that you're building up confidence that everything is building up together. So the different channels will all end up having a small probability for a background fluctuation at one specific mass. And so um, this is the, what is misleading about this plot is that, well, it's the easiest one to understand. You have two photons, the very mass, and you put it in, but it's really the one that has the largest possible background. And so that's, that's a totally legitimate question. Maybe one thing to add is also that you have measurements of other kinematic variables, so you can actually look at shapes rather than just the counts. Another question. Yes. La of the Higgs boson? Yeah. Not yet. No. No. We don't have any access to the width of the, of the Higgs boson at this point. Well, the point of so th this is a search, but it's not a search like I don't know. Uh, beyond standard model kind of search, a SUSE or extra dimension. This is not a model independent search. This is a super model dependent search. You know exactly what you want to look for. And this is the X in the standard model. Now what you do is, you look for something that looks like a X for the standard model. You see a bump like this. And of course the signal you put in is the theoretical prediction for that signal. And then once you see something like this, then you step back and you say, wait a sec, now I see a boson that in my understanding looks like the standard model, but now I want to see all the properties. And at that point you have to go on and so forth and so, or so on and so forth. And it's not quite the lifetime that will make you believing that that is the, the standard model, but really pinning down all these all this questions here.
I was sure you are, you're not throwing away the baby with the, with the water. Yes, that's a very good point. Maybe so you want to repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the question is, we have a, a huge online data reduction from about a billion events per second down to, whatever was it, this guy here, down to about a few hundreds that we can store and then analyze. So everything else is gone forever. You never recorded this. So are you sure you're not throwing away something interesting? Well, in a sense, you're right. We are very precise in what we select, and so we look only for what we think we want to see, we expect. But there are also some backup triggers just to avoid this kind of problem. We also take triggers which are really very much open and collect, well, eventually some very exotic signal, at the moment just background, basically. We didn't see anything like this. And these are triggers where you require basically a very small amount of details on the events. These are very loose kind of triggers, even just random triggers taken out to see if we can collect some. So, yes, it's true we throw away a lot of data, but it's also true that we are sufficiently confident we're th not throwing away anything very interesting. Right. Yes? So we have, in the gamma gamma, we have about uh, a hundred, order of hundreds of decays. Uh, in the ZZ, we have order of a dozen or so. And these are the ones where it's easy to answer this question because you have a nice mass peak. In the others, it's a bit more complicated, but again, these are the numbers. We're not, out of the 200,000 we, we're producing, we're not taking all of them, unfortunately. Coming back to this uh, throwing away problem, um, it seems to me that at present you're more doing a confirmation type of philosophy. Can you change that throw away philosophy if you go for, for discoveries? The throw away philosophy or confirmation philosophy again goes in the same direction of you only look for what you want. Uh, there is no technological way today to store all these events and to look at all of them sequentially and try to understand what's going on. If that is the goal, no, we are very, very far away from this. Uh, the point here is, again, that we have very loose triggers, and with those, we should be able to fetch anything that is coming out, even very weird, not yet thought of kind of scenarios point to be added perhaps is the fact that these triggers basically based on kinematics energy momentum conservation which is indeed an assumption but a pretty good one I would say okay uh, could you could you speak up I'll yeah. okay. the X mass unfortunately is not predicted by theory so that's why any kind of production study or the case study, uh, sorry, wrong direction, is done on a very large mass range. I'm sorry, I'm too slow with this stuff. Never mind. I mean, yeah, these things. So here you see we have very loose bounds. We don't have a prediction. We only have very loose bounds. We know the left side is actually very much constrained by previous measurements. For instance, at lab, we were excluding Higgs bosons up to 114 GV, more or less. And then the upper bound, that is given by theory. At that point, if you bump around the, the TV region, at this point, the standard model itself, the way it's built, kind of loses its meaning. So this is the, the kind of thing. Where the theories comes in with very important predictions are these curves here, the production uh, cross-sections, with their very small error bands, and the same thing in this plot here. All these are theory predictions. And now I see the theorist who wants to ask the question. <laughs> well, I would not really 
say that the theory goes completely blind to the Higgs mass, given that uh, yeah, combining no, no. with uh, data and uh, lab data, in order to be consistent with that, the Higgs had to be light. Yes, this but that's, if you want, is, a, is experimental bias you had. Yes. It's not a... Sure, we need data, but uh, for example, anyhow, as I said, the theory could say something about it by taking measurements, right? Um, the other thing that I wanted uh, to ask you is that I, I, I think you try very much to be careful by saying that this is a Higgs boson, but you are getting down to the path that uh, you will never be able formally to prove that something is something, right? That's correct. S scientifically, you cannot do that. You can yes. say that the hypothesis is rejected, but it can never be confirmed. Yes. And then maybe if you go down this path, you want to compare the Higgs hypothesis against other hypotheses. Is it not fair to say that at the moment there is no alternative which explains all of this data, not only your experiments data, but the universal data that we have in high energy physics, other than the Higgs boson as well as it, as, uh, it does? Yes, but if you want, that is exactly the way I set up the talk. Uh, by trying to answer, is it the Higgs boson? Uh, it's, it's weird to have a title, is, is it not the Higgs boson, <laughs> something like this. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, at the moment, the best description of all the phenomena we have is through the standard model and through this Higgs boson here. And from now on, well, there are two possible ways out to physics beyond the standard model, and both ways is seeing some deviation from the standard model. It's not confirming it, but it's disproving it with something else. And there are two ways, the indirect measurements, so you start now looking at virtual particles going through the loops. Or, of course, this is the, the tough way, because now you have to go very high precisely measuring everything, or something else might pop up. And some other particles will be the direct evidence of beyond standard model physics. Right. Are there any other questions? If that's not the case, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much for coming.